Well, hello, and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. Today, what I'd like to talk about is prayer. And this is a subject which, well, it's hard to think of something which has been more discussed over the years, more talked about. You'll find sermons on prayer, books on prayer, all kinds of things. Uh, And yet, at the same time, it's a subject that uh, Christians persist in struggling with. Um, You find regularly uh, people asking questions. Uh, As a pastor, I, I know this is an experience which will be shared by many other pastors as well. People um, frequently come uh, to us with questions about prayer, uh, particularly about unanswered prayer, and also about um, the practical difficulties and sometimes the personal stroke theological difficulties that people have actually getting down to praying. And so what I want to do is, well, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to solve all these problems. Um, I'm going to try and keep this to the usual kind of half an hour, which is at least my ambition with these podcasts. But what I do want to do is just to uh, share with you a few things that uh, in the Bible and theology classes here at All Saints for the young people we've been working through in the last uh, week or two. And some other thoughts that I've had which tie the subject of prayer together with other basic Christian disciplines, uh, scripture reading, and so on. Uh, And I want to try and give you a combination of some of the theological insights which I've been working through with the young people, and also some practical pointers, which really the aim is to put those theological insights and biblical insights, so to speak, to work in practice and to show uh, what I hope will be a pattern of personal prayer which is linked with Bible reading that will be helpful and fruitful for you and may help you to overcome some of the uh, difficulties that uh, if you're uh, like many Christians that I've spoken to that you may struggle with um, that make prayer sometimes feel like a bit of a burden, uh, sometimes feel uh, like it's something that's hard to discipline yourself to do and so on and so forth. So that's what the aim is Um, and I'm going to just start um, pretty simply, um, the young people and I have been reading through Calvin's Institutes, and uh, we've got to the second volume, uh, which is still in book three of four. Uh, Calvin's Institutes are divided into four books, uh, one, two, three, and four, and the, the final, well, no, close to the final chapter of the third book is on the subject of prayer. I'm going to read through a, a few paragraphs of this and just uh, talk about uh, what he's saying here and how this is linked to the rest of Calvin's theology. And I'm conscious that I've um, shared with you some other thoughts about that uh, in a, a, another recent series. Uh, you may spot some connections and that's deliberate. Uh, the aim is then to integrate what Calvin says about prayer with what he says elsewhere in uh, his writings and try and give you a sort of biblical framework for this. And then we'll just launch off into some practical things after that. So without further ado, uh, let me read uh, a paragraph or two, make some comments on it, and then we'll go from there. Okay, here goes. This is um, uh, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, book three, chapter 20, beginning at the first section. From those matters so far discussed, he writes, we clearly see how destitute and devoid of all good things man is, and how he lacks all aids to salvation. Therefore, if he seeks resources to succour him in his need, he must go outside himself and get them elsewhere. It was afterward explained to us that the Lord willingly and freely reveals himself in his Christ. For in Christ he offers all happiness in place of our misery, all wealth in place of our neediness. In him he opens to us the heavenly treasures that our whole faith may contemplate his beloved son. Our whole expectation depend upon him and our whole hope cleave to and rest in him. I'll just grab this book stand because it'll make it easier for me to put this thing up. Right, so what you've got there in the first paragraph, um, it doesn't sound like he's talking about prayer at all, and he's not. Uh, what he's doing is reminding you, reminding us, of the overall shape of his the- theology so far in relation particularly to the doctrine of salvation. And it goes something like this. Um, we in ourselves lack everything we need. We have nothing. We're lost. We're hopeless. We're sinful. We're dead outside of Christ. But Christ has everything that we need. In Christ, God has placed life and righteousness and holiness and truth and wisdom and salvation itself. Christ is the chosen one. Christ is the son of God. Christ is the one in whom God has placed every spiritual blessing. 
And the question, therefore, that um, Calvin addresses at the end of book two of his Institutes and the beginning of book three is this. Okay, we don't have any of these things. Christ has them all. So the question then at the beginning of book three is, well, how can we get those things? What can we do to receive what Christ has? And the answer is really simple in one sense. If it's Christ who has every blessing that we need, life and righteousness and truth and uh, uh, a relationship with the living God, his Father, and so on and so forth, then what we need is Christ. Jesus is the one we need. And so the question is, um, how far, how do we get him? And Calvin goes on to explain. Next paragraph. But after we've been instructed by faith to recognize that whatever we need and whatever we lack is in God and in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the Father willed all the fullness of his bounty to abide, so that we may all draw from it as from an overflowing spring, it remains for us to seek in him and in prayers to ask of him what we have learned to be in him. And just pause there one second and think about that. Previously, at the start of section three, the solution that Calvin gives to how we may receive all these things at Christ's hands is, well, we need Christ, and the way we receive him is by faith through the work of the Spirit. That's the massive hinge that takes us from the end of book two, the work of the Son, in uh, being our Redeemer, to book three, the work of the Spirit, in, so to speak, conferring those blessings upon us. Book three begins with this majestic section, book three, chapter one, section one and two, where um, Calvin explains that what we need is the Spirit to, to unite us with Christ, so that because we're one with him, we receive all the things that he has. The image of a husband and a wife is relevant here. Um, Christ the groom and his church is the bride and what we as the bride receive is everything that belongs to our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be united with him by the spirit. The same spirit indwells us as indwells him and therefore makes us one. And what that looks like from our perspective is faith. So Calvin then says, faith is the principal work of the spirit. Okay, so just track the logic so far. Christ has everything. What we need is Christ, the Spirit unites us with Christ, and faith is the principal work of the Spirit in us, because faith is what our relationship with Christ looks like from our perspective. But then you might ask, what's the principal work of faith? And Calvin's answer here is prayer. Just look at what he said again. So that, I'll paraphrase and then quote the, the section I've just read. We've been instructed by faith to recognise that everything we need is in Christ, God has told us that Christ is everything we need. What we need is to go get it from him, quote, and in prayers to ask of him what we have learned to be in him. Just think about that for a second. Prayer is the thing that we do, which is the chief exercise of our faith, by which we dig up, as Calvin's going to say in a second, all those riches that God the Father has buried in Christ. Faith then is not just some abstracted thing, uh, a, just a disposition of heart, although it is a disposition of heart. Faith is shown in prayer. Prayer is the thing by which faith makes itself known in coming to God the Father to ask for the things that God the Father has placed in the Son for us. And Calvin uses this illustration of, being, of digging up treasure a couple of times in these first couple of sections. And this is one, of, uh, I've said this a number of times, I think, um, one of my favourite sections in the Institutes. I've lots of favourite sections in the Institutes. This is another one. Um, let me just um, pick up again from where I left off. This is still in section one. Um, otherwise, that is to say, if we weren't to do this, to know God as the master and bestower of all good things who invites us to request them of him and still not to go to him and not ask of him, this would be of as little profit as for a man to neglect a treasure buried and hidden in the earth after it has been pointed out to him. Just think about the illustration. Um, the treasure is all of the blessings that God has bestowed on Christ. And we're invited to go get them. Faith is how we uh, relate to Christ so that we receive them. The Spirit is the one who unites us to Christ so that we receive those things. And prayer is that thing which we do, which manifests our faith, which is the chief work of the Spirit, by which we receive all those things. 
Prayer is the thing that God has given us to do, to ask of him all of the blessings that he's promised us in Christ. Think of all the things that he's uh, committed to give you. He's committed to forgive your sins. He's committed to restore you to himself. He's committed to guide and teach and strengthen you and give you wisdom and give you everything you need to resist every temptation and to grow in wisdom throughout your life so that you're able to handle with maturity and Christ-likeness and godliness every circumstance in which you find yourself. That's all in Christ and prayer is how you go get those things. Like He's told you there's treasure buried in a field over there somewhere. Prayer is the shovel by which you go and dig it up. Again, that's precisely the illustration that he uses in section two. Uh, I'll read another paragraph. Just kind of love this stuff and I hope you'll bear with me while I do it. It is therefore by the benefit of prayer that we reach those riches which are laid up for us with the Heavenly Father. You can see how this, he's now plumbing the depths, so to speak, of this illustration. He's, he's, uh, highlighted and, and the theological structure is laid up for us. For there is a communion of men with God by which, having entered the heavenly sanctuary, they appeal to him in person concerning his promises in order to experience, where necessity so demands, what they that what they believed was not in vain, although he had promised it in word alone. So we've entered the sanctuary, we now appeal to him in prayers to receive what we believe, because he's told us, that he's given to us in Christ. Therefore we see that to us nothing is promised to be expected from the Lord, which we are not also bidden to ask of him in prayers. That is a fascinating sentence, I think. There's nothing, Calvin says, that God has promised us, which he doesn't also say we should ask him for. And the way we ask is prayer. All of the things that God has bestowed on us in Christ, he has given for our good. Uh, they're ours by faith. The Spirit unites us with Christ so we may receive them. And, and every single one of them, what we're called upon to do is to ask him for them in prayer. In other words, we have this relationship with the Father by the Spirit through Christ in prayer. And it's in the context of that relationship, that ongoing conversation where we hear him speak the promises of his word and we respond in prayer that's the relationship in the context of which we receive all these things that he's promised to us uh, this the next bit is the sentence that i was referring to my one of my favorites it goes so true is it that we dig up by prayer the treasures that were pointed out by the lord's gospel and which our faith has gazed upon we dig up by prayer the treasures in Christ that have been pointed out by the Lord's gospel, the things that the gospel, which is a way of talking about the fulfillment of all the promises of scripture in Christ. The gospel has promised certain things are in Christ and we dig up those things by prayer. So just pause a second and just think about this. Um, what this means is um, prayer is not like the extra thing that we do when we have a particular problem that we need help to deal with. Prayer is rather the manifestation on our part of the relationship with God in the context of which he gives us everything that he sees that we need. Those things which he's already promised to us, which he's already bestowed on Christ himself, and which he knows that we need and he wants to give us. Uh, he invites us to ask him and to seek those things in him by prayer. Now, one of the questions that raises, um, and this is another issue that we talked about in the Bible and Theology class, so I'm just shuffling books around here because my desk isn't big enough to accommodate the microphone and laptop and all of these different books I've got. There we are, I think that's okay. Uh, one of the things that we talked about in the, the class a week or two ago um, was this question of unanswered prayer. Because on the face of it, Scripture speaks in fairly unqualified terms uh, in support of what Calvin is saying here, that you know, God has promised all these things to us and will bestow them upon us. All we need to do is go and ask for him. Uh, so you've got, for example, Mark 7. Uh, let me read Mark 7, verses 7 to 11. Bear with me a second. I'm going to have a cup of my Earl Grey tea. Hmm. It's better if you're human again now. Okay, so Mark 7, 7 to 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. 
Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And so you can see, most fundamentally here, the purpose of what Jesus is saying is to reassure us, along the lines of um, what Calvin, 1500 years later, would say, that when God sees that we have need of good things and we come to him and ask, then he'll give them to us. Why, why would a father deny those good things that his children need when they come to him? Now, at the same time, uh, this does raise those questions I alluded to earlier about you know, prayers that aren't answered. And so we were musing on this and, and working through some of the um, uh, reasons why we might experience uh, that thing that's so familiar where you pray for something and it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen immediately or it never happens. Um, and many people know not just the, um, the the experience of praying for something which they subsequently come to realize is a little unwise or, or perhaps childish, but they also know the experience of praying for something for a very long time and it taking years or decades to come about. Or the experience of praying for something which really seems like a good thing, like the healing of a sick and young relative, and it not happening. And and one of the tragedies of, well, there are many tragedies in the Christian life, aren't there? And all of our experience, we all know of people who've either experienced firsthand or secondhand, those kinds of um, terrible circumstances where you, think you really can't understand why God wouldn't have granted that answered prayer. And so sorting through this, um, uh, well, the students and I, they were a little help from Calvin and um, I guess me a little bit, um, came up with a, with a number of thoughts which may help just in, in sifting through some of these puzzles. And the first thing to say, and it didn't take um, the young people long to figure this one out, is just imagine a world in which God granted absolutely everything we asked for immediately. Just think what would happen in a world where there was literally no restriction on the miraculous and outlandish things that you could ask God for, and they would just instantly be given to you. Now, clearly, such a world is would be so nonsensical just at face value that um, nobody could imagine that that's actually what Jesus means here. He doesn't mean... mean um, asking it will be given to you literally whatever it is. Lord, I'd like a new yacht, preferably levitating its way to my study outside the window and hanging there in midair until I um, go and um, snap my fingers at it um, uh, later on this afternoon and it just floats its way over to Lake Arlington where I'll be able to sail it. You know, that's just, it's very easy to dream up hypothetical scenarios which would make a nonsense of a kind of absolutely unqualified uh, God will answer all your prayers, theology. And indeed, that's uh, hinted at even by Jesus' words here. To look at the end of verse 11. Um, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The, the good things is obviously intended to qualify, and I guess in that sense then, limit those things that the Lord will give us, at least to the point where he isn't going to give us dumb things. And what would be a, a dumb thing for him to give us? Something uh, like the, the specious example I just gave is anything that would tend to our immaturity or our ungodliness or our foolishness, or perhaps more subtly, and Calvin points this out later in this chapter, I won't read it, but uh, he mentions the danger of um, prayer um, being frivolous. Another writer I'm going to allude to in, in a moment or two, P.T. Forsyth, highlights that we would very quickly come to take God for granted if we could just snap our fingers and get whatever we wanted. But, but more subtly, um, the, the prayers which are not bad prayers, the, the good prayers, the godly prayers, that aren't answered immediately or aren't answered even at all, what are we to make of them? And again, this was, it didn't take um, the young people long to uh, figure this one out. The part of the purpose of those delayed prayers is actually to create a certain disposition within us, a disposition towards patience 
and maturity and uh, and more than that um, to uh, humble us to the point where we realize that we don't know best um, one of uh, the young ladies in the class when I said what would it be like um, Try and imagine the situation in which God would give you anything you asked for immediately. All your prayers would be answered straight away. She reacted, uh, saying, well, I don't think I'd dare to pray for anything. Which strikes me as a very wise and mature response, because seriously, if anything you ask the Lord for will be given you unqualifiedly, immediately, we would be in a position where our judgment could be fatally flawed, and could plunge, not just ourselves, but countless other people into all kinds of ruin and destruction. And, and anybody sane wouldn't dare open their mouths at all. What godliness and maturity as a, as a Christian wants is our requests to be subject to the will of our Heavenly Father, both in the time of their execution and even in the fact of them. And one of the things we're wrestling with there is that um, God knows best even when we're really sure that this would be a good thing. God works all things for the good of those who love him. All things, including those things that look to us like they're working out um, for evil. So there's a bunch of things to think about there. Um, but I, there's another point which I think would be helpful to um, reflect on. I'm going to pop this over there. I might need it in a few minutes, but we'll see. Um, which is that um, Calvin's way of uh, fleshing out the function of prayer up to this point has treated prayer rightly as the indispensable and essential means to the end of receiving all of the good things which God has bestowed upon us in Christ through the gospel. Um, prayer is how we receive those good things. Now that's all true. Um, nothing I'm about to say should undermine that. But what if the function of prayer, if we can talk in those terms, um, is not simply as a means to some other end. What if prayer is itself the end, the goal of the Christian life? And to this uh, end, reflecting on this, I want to turn you to a, another great little book. Um, this is one Pastor Neil has recommended over the, over the years a number of times. Uh, and he recommended it so highly that I thought, I need to get a copy of this. It's by P.T. Forsyth. It's called The Soul of Prayer. So I've been reading this. It really is insightful. Um, there are moments in P.T. Forsyth's career. He was a uh, late 19th, early 20th century British theologian. And um, uh, there there are moments in his theology where I, I think, oh, hold on a second. Um, but uh, he's a great guy. And um, None of the, the kind of minor quibbles we might have here and there should uh, cause us to reject anything like wholesale or the other things he's writing. But here on in page 13 of this edition, let me highlight something or read something that he highlights and uh, you can see what you think of it. Prayer is often represented as the great means of the Christian life. There we are, that's a good summary of Calvin. But it is no mere means. It is the great end of that life. It is, of course, not untrue to call it a means. It is so, especially at first. But at last, it is truer to say that we live the Christian life in order to pray than that we pray in order to live the Christian life. Now that strikes me as a, a profoundly significant insight. Um, to illustrate, um, Imagine that you are taking out um, your uh, husband or wife or son or daughter or mum or dad for a meal somewhere. Imagine it, like you decided you're going to treat them for their birthday or something like that. Um, and you, you go and sit down at the table. And maybe, maybe you're there with a bunch of friends or maybe it's just you and them. And you sit down and, and then you, you're sitting there and you produce a, a list of things, a list of questions you'd like to ask them and requests you'd like to make of them. Now, maybe sometimes you have meals like that, but I think if we always did that, the people that we are friends with and our family members might start to think we'd become a little bit odd because maybe not even just odd, somewhat insulting, in fact, because it would start to look like what we really wanted from them was those things on our bullet point list and that we weren't really interested in relationship with them. 
you think about it for a second, when you go out for a meal with somebody, or when you just sit down for a cup of coffee with somebody, or just whatever it is, whatever social context, it's not simply the case that you do so because you have a bunch of things you want from them. You do sometimes do that. I sometimes have a little list of questions I'm to ask people on a Sunday morning. But very often, what I do is, I, and I'm sure you, want to sit down with somebody just to be with them. There's no agenda. It's not that you want something from them. The conversation and the meal and the fellowship is not a means to some other end. It is the end. If you take your wife out, gentlemen, if you take your wife out for a meal, uh, uh, you, you have every right to be slightly surprised if she sort of turns around and says, so now what do you want? <laughs> that might indicate that something's gone wrong elsewhere. In fact, what you do, if you're wise, um, uh, with all those people who are close to you, who are important to you, is you just spend time together. And the relationship that is cultivated in that context is the point of the encounter. And so it is in prayer. It seems to me that it's worth rethinking what prayer is for. Not to say we shouldn't have our prayer list, our list of bullet points. You know, people were asking this for, you know, son's got to get his college applications in, praying for my daughter doing this, praying for my wife and husband doing whatever else it is, praying for myself at work, praying for a work colleague, praying for a non-Christian neighbour. All those things are good and right. But they take their place within a context where what the point of our prayer is, is communion with God. And at this point, it's very tempting to, um, to think of prayer in, what would we say, um, the kind of contemplative terms which we're not so familiar with in our tradition. There have been um, many traditions in the history of the church which have thought of prayer in terms of communion with God. And it has turned in some cases into a, a kind of uh, exercise in mental discipline and concentration where the aim has been to empty your mind of all other distractions and concerns. And it's become a kind of mystical thing, uh, akin to uh, some forms of meditation, where what you're trying to do is to clear your mind of everything and just focus on the divine. Now, I want to suggest that's a mistake. There have been some Christian traditions like that, some mystical traditions, the stylites in the early church, people who, the desert hermits, people who went out away from everything in order to remove from themselves all sensory and cognitive input so they could just be left alone. They'd strip everything else away and simply be left, they thought, with the living God. Now, I think that's a mistake. We don't find the living God. We don't draw close to the living God by stripping everything else away. Seems to me a couple of thoughts are in order here. The first thing is that the way that God communes with us, speaks to us, is in his word, the Bible. So from a practical standpoint, what we're trying to do, if we're trying to cultivate that relationship with God, is to speak with him in a way that reflects and responds to how he speaks to us. And at this point, I want to get um, uh, practical in, in a way that I hope might help to reinvigorate um, or give some kind of uh, a fresh direction to your Bible reading as well as your prayer. A lot of the time um, in our traditions, we've inherited a, a set of practices where we know that daily Bible reading is a good idea, so we read our Bibles, and then we maybe read a chapter or two or three a day, or maybe you read for a certain amount of time, I don't know what you do. And then we think, okay, I've got to pray, and then maybe if you're really organised, you have like a prayer list or something, and if you're less organised, you have sort of a mental list. Um, but you kind of have Bible reading and then prayer. And within that context, the Bible reading sometimes kind of dries up because, you know, you, you have your schedule, and if you fall a day or two behind, you're then stuck. Do I try and catch up, or do I just concede that I'm not very good at this? And then you get slightly depressed about it. And your prayer becomes a bunch of bullet points, which equally you can get behind on. And they seem sort of disconnected from... The, the time you're spending as a whole in the word and in prayer. So what if we instead make a practice of bringing these two together? Think of not Bible reading, pause, and then prayer, but Bible reading and prayer, or perhaps better, prayerful Bible reading. So we try to integrate our prayers for people 
with what we're hearing from God in the word. Think of it like this. Your, your, your scripture reading is God's side of the conversation that takes place when you're in an attitude of prayer. You're setting this time aside for him. You want to hear from him. How do you hear from him? It's in the scriptures. Now, obviously, you can be hearing from him in scriptures that you're not reading. Part of the function of reading the Bible is to inform, our, so, so to speak, our theological background so that we have instincts in relation to what God's will is and what, what God's word says. But in that immediate moment, you're reading whatever it is, Psalms, Proverbs, Mark, Romans, Ezekiel. It, well, I mentioned those things because those, those are the bits on my Bible reading program this morning. You're reading those things. And you're simultaneously learning from what scripture says about God and actually hearing from him and relating to him there and then. Now, here's the insight that uh, has been helpful to me on and off over the years. And I wonder, maybe helpful to you. And it's prompted by what uh, Forsyth says and what Calvin says. What if we bring together our prayers for particular people with whatever it happens to be that we're reading that day? Uh, the example I used the other day, I. I uh, Bible and theology class, I think it was yesterday, Thursday. Today it's Friday morning. Um, I just I opened the book of Proverbs at random. And I, one of the students, I won't tell you who it is, I said, let's suppose I'm, uh, I think I turned to 17, 1. Um, that's right. I opened the Bible, book of Proverbs at random, chapter 17, verse 1. I said, imagine I'm praying for you today. I'm reading, I'm reading half a dozen Proverbs. I get to 17, 1. Better a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. And I glance down at my prayer list and I say, uh, John Snoopin, here it is. And now, what do I pray for him? Have you ever had that experience where you've you've got somebody on your prayer list and you know they have some particular need, but that's what you prayed for them last week. And it's okay, you could pray the same thing again, but what else could you pray? Why not bring them into contact with what the living God has just said to you? The living God has just told you that it's better to have a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife, Proverbs 17, 1. So I pray that this young man um, would actually have at least a dry morsel and pray that actually he'd be productive and be able to provide for his family. But in those times in the future where um, he might be uh, less well off, his family might be struggling financially, pray that he would not uh, so value the house full of feasting that he'd rather have that with strife. Pray that he would have, at the very least, his house would be a place of peace and calm and quiet and and um, love and grace, so that even if they're materially deprived, Lord, would this young man uh, have peace? Would he have quiet? Would he have joy around his family table? Now, what have we done there? Um, we've simply brought that portion of the word of God, what God is saying to us, into the conversation that we're having with God, in such a way that we're bringing to him a request concerning what he has promised to give to his people. Has he not promised to give to his people um, the wisdom and maturity to pursue not um, feasting, if it means strife, but quiet, even if that means relative poverty? Hasn't he promised that wisdom? Well, yeah, he has, and he's promised it in response to faithful prayer from people for those blessings. And so in this way, you can bring what God says to us, and thus what he promises to us, into contact with how we speak back to God in prayer in those, now what I'm suggesting, integrated times of prayerful Bible reading. I encourage you to try it, perhaps particularly if you're um, looking for some new ideas about um, Bible reading and prayer. Um, it's easier to do with some parts of scripture than others. And so that's a good reason for varying the bits of the Bible you're looking at. If you're always reading uh, a psalm or a part of the psalm, if it's a longer one, and you're always reading a handful of Proverbs every day, you will always have something practical and meaningful to pray about for anybody in the world. Uh, and that's the case even if the rest of your Bible reading is taking you to parts of the scriptures that either you don't understand very well or don't seem so practically or immediately relevant. Those parts of the scripture will inform your prayers over time. But obviously I grant that there are, you know, there are lists of names in First Chronicles that don't immediately 
um, shout forth obvious prayer points for your friends and family. I can grant that. So mingle that in with uh, other bits of uh, Psalms and Proverbs and other uh, practical portions of the scriptures, um, bits of the Gospels or bits of the New Testament letters, so that the scriptures, whichever bit you're reading, whichever bits you're reading, there's always somewhere in there in which you're hearing God speak to you about specific things that he's calling upon you to ask him for, for yourself and for other people. And in this way, I think what we'll be doing is we'll be allowing Calvin's rich and deeply informed theology of prayer to combine with what um, Professor Forsyth says about prayer as the goal of the Christian life. And it will help us to uh, be disciplined and to be excited increasingly about bringing our prayer and our scripture reading together for our benefit and the immense benefit of many other people. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, as always, especially if you're at All Saints, I invite um, comments and questions if you've got any thoughts about anything that you hear on this podcast. Uh, you know how to get hold of me. Just give me a shout. It'll always be a pleasure to talk with you. But for now, I think that'll do. God bless and bye for now. Thank you.